This week on Wealth Track, celebrating 25 years of stock picking with the Motley Fool co-founders. David and Tom Gardner are next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences. And the Fairholm Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Stock picking might be out of favor, but it can still work. This week's guests are living proof that old-fashioned, bottom-up, company-by-company research can beat the market. And you can have fun doing it as well. Our guests are the Motley Fool's co-founders, two brothers, David and Tom Gardner. They launched the Motley Fool with a good friend in a backyard shed in 1993 as a small print newsletter. Fast forward to today and The Motley Fool is a giant global online investment advisory service with 12 million investors a month logging in to thefool.com, subscribing to their dozens of newsletters and other investment services, listening to their podcasts or exchanging ideas on hundreds of their community boards. Their Motley Fool wealth management service oversees $1.5 billion in assets and they have more than $900 million in their three mutual funds and recently launched ETF. Their oldest fund, the Motley Fool Global Opportunities Fund, is rated four-star by Morningstar and has handily beaten its market benchmark and world stock category. Since their flagship stock advisor newsletter was launched in 2002, its portfolio has also beaten the market by a wide margin. Older brother David's swing for the fences growth strategy has clocked in a better than 600% cumulative return, while younger brother Tom's less volatile value strategy has turned in a better than 160% gain. They both maintain it's relatively easy to beat the market once you get the core principles down. I asked Tom to describe the core principles. I think the first is to track your returns against the market. You don't know if you're beating the market if you don't know what the market is doing. So it starts with looking at an index fund or the S&P 500 and just seeing what the historical returns of that are and what it's going to take to beat that. So that's step one. Step two is your time horizon. It's very hard for an individual investor to beat the market if they're trading every three days, three weeks, three months. The best holding period, Warren Buffett has said, is forever. And in our case, we love to hold our companies at least three, five, seven years and really let them grow. And then the third is whether or not the business has a leadership team that's going to be around for a long time. Succession is very difficult in the public markets. So when you find a Warren Buffett or a Mark Zuckerberg or a Jeff Bezos or so many great founder-run companies, I think if you take those three principles, a founder-run company that hold that for 10 years and track yourself against the market, the odds of beating the market are pretty good. Did you really want to mention the first one, which was you're tracking yourself against the market? Is that disappointing to you? Most, yes. I would say that, um, I would say that. That's a core principle to be. I mean, let's just keep score. I love keep score. it. Keep score. Yeah, keeping score. No, no, no. But, but so if, if you're underperforming the market, therefore you're saying that you're doing something wrong. So the core principle is to make sure you outperform the market. But in order to outperform the market, I need a core principle to invest to, to begin with. You need to, you need to understand what the market does and you need to understand that most of Wall Street, yeah. most of the mutual funds that we're familiar with, most of the financial, professional financial communities around the world perform below the market's average. Right. And so one way, key way to beat the market is to start by knowing what the market is doing. When you learn what happened and you didn't do so well, you start going, okay, I need to pick better stocks. And that's what Tom and I were doing early on with the Molly Fool. Actually, as a newsletter, before we even had started online, we were basically picking stocks. And if you saw our initial stock picks, they weren't that great. Yeah. Most of them were mine and the companies were pretty disappointing. So guess what? We scored that and we realized, you know, probably we don't have the right thesis about how to invest. And so it is that act of scoring and transparently scoring. And from day one of The Motley Fool, we've always shown all of our work. So anybody can come in and see all of our good picks and bad picks. And so scoring in a world where people go constantly on to CNBC or other networks and make predictions about the market, no one holds them accountable. No one has right. them back on and says, you said when you last were here. So 
there's constant opining with very little scoring. Okay, so, so I think so, that's so, what so, I meant to say. All right, score. That was <laughs> so when you well, well, it's okay. He is your older brother. Yes. To be a better investor, you've got to beat the market. That's like first principle. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And then I mean, okay. from there, if you just look through history, what are the companies that have thrived over five-year periods, ten-year periods? Not not a six-month momentum play, but actually a business that's fundamentally thriving. What are some of the elements of companies like that? There are companies that have uh, strong sales growth, indicating there's a lot of demand for what they're offering. They have the ability to raise prices. They often have a leadership team that's going to be around for the next 10 to 15 years. They're not getting stock options and looking for the exit ramp um, you know, in a, in a hot market. So these elements are there. These patterns are there in the public markets and in, in public markets around the world. And I think that a lot of that story gets lost right. with the financial media world that is so focused on what's happening today and missing the larger story of the great businesses compounding wealth. All right, so, so, so last question on the point of scoring yourself against the market is over what period is it, mm. it legitimate to score yourself against the market? So I like to start from day one. When I pick a stock, the very next day I'm already scoring it because I, yep. I, I, I note my cost basis and I see where the market was. And of course it's meaningless the first day, just like um, if you're a fan of the New York Yankees, how they actually play tomorrow is not really a big deal for the next 10 years of their of your being a fan, right? So, but with every passing day, that you know, that gives you a first inning, a second, and a third inning. You might still be only a third of the way through, but often the score in the third inning can be indicative of where things end up. So, by scoring frenetically and con constantly, we I think we get an early read, and in general, it's a, it's allowed us to. Um, find the, some of the best companies of our time because they tend to keep go, going up and up and up like yeah. Netflix or yeah. Amazon. So Except I, I think it's important to score. Except they don't keep going up and up. I mean, there have been times when Amazon was down like 60%. Definitely. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, well, then, then you're telling yourself, hey, I've just failed. Like, well, you know, having mm -hmm. sat through that, having bought Amazon at $3.21 right. and then watching it go to 95 and then one year later go down to seven in 2001 and yes. kept holding all the way through. Right. So we're definitely familiar with how, but what's funny about that is you, you go back and look at a stock chart of Amazon today and see that 2001 drop. And as you probably know, it's, it's like barely even noticeable. Right. Um, and that's, that's a really important view for people mm -hmm. who, who invest or people who don't understand investing yet, don't know that by definition, it's the long term. Mm -hmm. The opposite of investing is trading. We don't do that at The Motley Fool. So we love those long graphs and the learnings you can see in them. And we score from day one. More data that comes from our results over 25 years. Um, a small fraction of our investments drive the majority of our returns. That's not true if you're holding for a week or a year because you're not going to get the separation of a Netflix from an otherwise mediocre or failing investment that you make. But maybe one out of 10 of our investments drive 90% of our returns. Right. And so that's that. So I, you two each run different portfolios. Mm. So let me ask you about those. And so why don't we start with the more value orientation? That's the way it's described, Tom. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how would you describe your approach? And then I'll ask David how to describe his. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, do you, it's only one out of 10? I mean, well, one out of 10 that, that produce the, the biggest gains, right? Mm -hmm. And that's true in the value portfolios? As well as it's the, probably, it's a little bit less true okay. for my approach. So, uh, so what, still, to, to describe it, your approach because value, who knows what that means? Yeah, I think yeah. that 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 word has lost meaning as, right, as growth has. Um, right. in the investment world. Um, I would say that my approach is is long term. We share that we're both growth oriented in terms of finding businesses that are expanding and have big opportunities around the world. Um, probably the biggest difference in our portfolio management style between David and me is I I will sometimes raise the cash position in my portfolio to try and provide some buffer when the market goes down. I think mathematically. That's actually probably a bad idea over 20-year mm -hmm. periods, sure. but a lot of investors lose returns because they make bad behavioral decisions along the way. When the market falls 20%, they freak out and sell when that's the perfect time to be adding to your position. So in the portfolios I'm managing, I like to have some cash on the sidelines so that people can position themselves, as Jeff Fisher, a great investor at our company, says, to take advantage of a down market. So that, that would be a small gap that exists between Dave and I, but I'd okay. say we're but, more similar than different. So, but my returns other, are also a lot better than mine. But my other question is, you're you're describing it as a portfolio approach. Mm. And in fact, you know, you buy individual stocks. So, mm. so I guess I'm, I'm asking you, is there a difference in the types of stocks 
that you tend to invest in mm -hmm. versus what David tends to invest in? And then I'll ask him the same question. I will but. be interested to hear David's answer. I'd say maybe I focus a little bit more on the leadership team and the founder and the culture of that business. Okay. That may be a greater area of focus. I think for David, it's more about the disruptive innovations that are happening in the world. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm looking a little bit more at what that decision-making methodology is at the board level and with the CEO and the management team. And for that reason, I love companies. There's a company, Appian, that's a relatively small company, market cap, two to three billion dollars. The founder, CEO, started the company in the late 1990s, and here he is in the public markets owning 45% of the business. It's absolutely unbelievable to have that size of a stake 20 years into your company and in the public markets. And I know that that person uh, he's a very bright and dedicated person, but he's got a big asset that he's managing. And Warren Buffett says, I like people who are managing that company as if it's their only asset for the next 50 years. And mm -hmm. that's the sort of thing that I look for. Okay. Yeah. And Appian is, is on your buy now recommended list, right? Yes, it is. Right, currently. Yep. All right. So, David, how would you describe your investment style? And I, and I know, as we said, it's been called growth but you describe it to me as more innovation oriented. I, I, yeah. I mean, I'll just say that um, I am trying to find the greatest companies of our time. Um, so, and what does that mean? So, well, it means partly reading the zeitgeist. <laughs> now, I never did study German that well, but I'm pretty sure it means the spirit of the age. Yes, absolutely. So I like to ask ourselves, the zeitgeist, what is the spirit of the age? You want to be able to tell all of our grandchildren, I owned Netflix or I own Amazon during those right. decades. Right. My goal is basically to get um, members into the companies that are the zeitgeist companies and often they look dodgy at first. Yeah. People think Amazon will never make money. They think Netflix will get put out of business by Walmart when Walmart lets you drop off movies right at Walmart, these kinds of things. And so there's doubt about those companies. And so I like to say those are the rule breakers because they're breaking the rules of how we think the world works. And so the approach is uh, been consistent fr from the beginning pretty much for me. It's just right. something that it comes naturally to me. I love innovation and disrupt disruption as Tom mentioned. And, and I know you've got the six rule breakers and and I, I know one of them, I mean you mentioned in, in the um, early on is that momentum, I mean just you, you tend to like stocks that keep going up. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't. Well, but, but it's but, actually counterintuitive, isn't it? Because yeah. so many people think it's buy low, sell high. Yes, and, and so people mislead themselves into thinking they need to find discarded cigarette butts, you know, cigar butts as, as the stocks they should be buying, when actually you should be finding the best companies of your time. And just like the market itself, if you look at it over the last century, it tends to go like that. Yes, there are those dips. We talked about that earlier. But think about that century long view of the Dow Jones. It looks like that, right? It keeps making new highs. So the best companies, tend to keep making new highs, but people, sadly and ironically, think that they shouldn't buy them at the new high. Right. They think, well, you have to wait for a dip. And that's why I've written an essay once entitled, Dips Buy on Dips, because I don't think that's a great way to think about investing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you ever buy in a dip, Tom? I don't mind being a dip occasionally yeah, exactly. if there's a great company that's gone temporarily out of favor. So Yeah, what's but, wrong with buying a great company that has gone temporarily out of favor? What's I, wrong I, with that, I think David? there's nothing wrong yeah. with it. However, I think that David's point is a very important yeah. point for investors, which is if everyone had the discipline throughout their lifetime of adding to their winners, people will ask us, hey, out of the recommendations you have, how can I find which are the best ones? Generally, they're the ones whose stocks are winning because that's an indication that the business is winning. It's not always true, right. and some of them will end up failing. But on average, in aggregate, across the hundreds of companies that our investors follow at The Motley Fool around the world, the ones that perform well are indicating those businesses are thriving, and they end up being the collection that is the 10% that drives 90% yeah. of your return. But what's wrong with cheap? I mean, I, I mean, isn't isn't that something that you want to look for too, David? So for me, I think that I want to find the best. Okay. And when we think Regardless about the, the best, price. usually the best has higher premium pricing, right? Yes. That's yeah. just true of life. So I think the same thing is true of the stock market, and I'm more than happy to do it. And in part, Consuelo, because many people never ever touch those stocks. They think that you should never pay more than 40 times earnings for any company, right? Or if a company hasn't made money, they won't even have it on their watch list. Right. So I specifically like to look where other people have <laughs> roped off zones and say they won't go there, and that's where, that's where we hunt. And ironically, the best companies of our time actually live in that roped off zone where a lot of investors don't allow themselves to buy right. Amazon until like last year. They finally are like, all right, I'll buy the stock now because they're they're on top of the world. But you know, our cost is three dollars and twenty one cents because we're willing to go in there and find those companies earlier stage. Okay. So you're talking about your successes. 
but 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 also you were the first to admit to me that of, of the, the Motley Fool portfolios, you probably have the most losers. Indeed, right? I always will. So, so so what's so what constitutes a loser? So for me, a loser first and foremost is a company that loses to the market's average over the course of time. So that means if okay. you and I held a stock for five or ten years, and at the end of that, it's behind the S and P five hundred. You could have bought an index fund instead and just gotten that return. Then I call that a loser. And funny enough, I was looking at this just the other day. Um, my biggest loser in Motley Fool Rule Breakers, which we've been running since October 2004, two stock picks a month. So it's about 300 or more picks at this point. The biggest loser is Sohu, which is a Chinese company. It's a fine company. It's not done well over the 10 years we've held it. It's actually only down 5%, but it's our biggest loser because ah. the market is up 310% over the course of that time. Right. And so that delta of minus 315 is the single worst pick that I've made, even though I've picked stocks that have lost 80% of their value. But we're always marking against the market. And if you do the math with me, you'll see that Sohu was, in fact, the worst pick that we've made. When do you sell time? You've got this everlasting portfolio, and, and, a, and you and I have talked about this before, that it's a minimum holding period of five years. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, gee, even if a company's losing, you're sticking with it for mm. five years. I mean, and, mm. you know, you're going to willing to fall on your sword on principle mm. or how, I mean, how does how does that work? Mm. Well, I think it starts as a teaching tool for people to understand that the great returns you're going to get from the stock market are going to come from companies that you hold for a very long period of time. Yeah. So orienting yourself to think that way when you buy, if you knew you could not exit an investment that you were making. How would you think differently about that stock or any other investment you made in your life? So, so has that been a better discipline for you? If, if you know, no matter what happens, I'm going to stick with this company for five years, then therefore you work harder, that you do better research going before you I think that's you certainly it? true, and that's part you of think it. So? I certainly yeah. do believe that that's true okay. and true for anyone that would be you know, using that as a discipline. Yeah. But I also think that you learn by looking at the mathematics of what happens in your portfolio that your losers are becoming less relevant to your portfolio all the time. Now, emotionally, we're wired to feel the pain of loss much more than the joy right. of gain. And so we're sitting there kicking the dirt and feeling like, why did I buy that? It's down 40%. I'm embarrassed. It looks terrible in my portfolio. I want to sell and get rid of it. But if you actually hold it, you will continue to learn the lesson of why you made that investment and how you should think differently next time while not putting much money in your portfolio at risk. Those are, those are the losers. And when you have a 10 bagger or a 30 bagger alongside in your portfolio, you're not even going to really see those mathematically in your returns. Right. So do, do people, is it easier for people to stick with your approach, Tom, than it is with David's? Or, or is there a certain kind of investor that does belong in your kind of portfolios that that wouldn't in David's or Well, I don't think there's versa. a Motley Fool a... orthodoxy, and that's one okay. of the fun parts of this conversation is that you have two, the, the two, two of the founders of our company talking about their investment style, right. which has a lot of similarities and some differences. Then we have people who are using options at the Motley Fool, and that was completely off limits for us when we started the company. But then we had an investor come in and lay out how to use options very conservatively, not to be the person going to the casino table and gambling, but to be the casino that is taking a little bit of income off all the bets that are being made in the in the. And, and, and are you using options in, you, in the neither of us that you run? Use neither options. of you do. You're doing However, straight stocks. Our company is, is, right. is using options. <laughs> our company has turnaround investing. Our company has analysts that are looking for cheap stocks. Yeah. So all of these things are part of the motliness of, of the Motley Fool. You're getting a more growth-oriented perspective perspective from the two of us. So I just don't think that there's um, one discipline that wins. There are just many ways to succeed. I would say the one thing that I believe that we have crystallized at The Fool is the best way to win by the biggest margin over a long period of time. I think our styles over the next three months could be terrible for somebody. Yeah. But over the next 30 years, I challenge anyone to come up with an approach like the approaches at The Motley Fool in terms of driving market beating tax efficient returns. Right. So your approach then, in case it wasn't clear, mm. so your approach then you think that you've learned over 25 years is foolproof? Oh my God. Is that possible? Uh, I, I, that I would say that, number one, forgive me, but I love but it. Is, I wouldn't, I would never say that because we yeah. don't know what's going to happen in the world. You've got Ray Kurzweil at Google, the brilliant technologist, saying by 2029, we will not be able to distinguish humans from robots. None of us know what that world's going to be like. I'm not going to pretend that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to pretend that the, anything is foolproof. I mean, our, the very nature of our brand and our concept is uh, hey, we're going to make mistakes. We're right. going to learn along the way and do it as a community together. However, if you go back 100 years, there is not a 20-year period in U.S. stock market history where you did not make money. And that's 
not just taking 1900 to 1920, it's taking January 1, 1900 to January 1, 1920. Every day, all the way forward to today, there's never been a 20 year period where you lost money investing in stocks. If children, families, if people in business were taught to think this way, we would make better decisions. Right. It, however, individual stocks do lose money and investors have lost money over the years. And I'm mean, looking at thinking of my grandfather in the great depression. It's so I guess the, the, the theory is you two are picking individual stocks. And I, I know one of your pieces of advice is that for most people, they should just own an index fund because they don't have the kind of the wherewithal, the stick-to-itiveness, whatever, the psychological makeup to actually pick individual stocks. Yes, but right? I'll say, well, we, I think that's a great starting point. Mm. We've also, Tom and I have said over the years, everybody in America should own at least one stock. Mm. So it's not that we don't think people have the mentality. In fact, okay. it is by dipping your toe in and going against the grain, because you're going against the grain if you buy an individual stock today. If you actually right, no, buy no, directly, no question. right? Yes. So we encourage you to break those rules and then get your feet wet and yeah, buy a couple of companies that you admire for your kids, buy, buy Disney, right? Own shares directly. Tom and I happen to have had the great fortune of being raised in a household where we didn't even own funds. Our dad was just, and maybe this is true of your grandparents, your family as well, Consuelo, but we're just all stocks all the time. We've been mm -hmm. all stocks all the way through. But when it came time to start a site, fool.com, and give advice to anybody who come in worldwide, and what's our first piece of advice? It's get an index fund mm -hmm. because from, that's going to work for everybody. Right. Uh, but we also think that everybody should, I mean, so, wait, get so beyond if, that. Right? If, if there's one if, stock if that one should own, I mean, you know, we asked this at the end of every wealth talk, you know, one investment yep. for long-term diversified portfolio. So what's your choice? So I don't like the one stock question. I know you don't. Because, no one because, does. Because I could easily be wrong about this one. Right. But if, if I had my 10, you know, which I won't do right now, then I'd be very confident. But just having fun and, and taking on the spirit of the question, uh, I'm just going to out of the blue. Let's go with Live Nation. All right. Live Nation. So Explain Live Nation, Live Nation. Sure. Live Nation, the ticker symbol is LYV. This is a company that um, in a world where musical artists, you may have noticed, don't make too much money off their CDs anymore. Right. Uh, instead, it's all about those live events and concerts. And so Live Nation is the premier player in this industry. They own the venues. Often they've partnered or in some cases own the artists. And they bought Ticketmaster. So you buy the tickets from Live Nation to go to their venues to see their artists. They're working with some of the biggest acts in the world. I don't see a lot of competition there. So if we're talking about 10 years forward, yes. um, this, is, this isn't going to, going to outpace um, some the great stocks of the next 10 years probably. But if we're looking for a solid company that I just see strong competitive advantage for, which is such an important uh, aspect of our investing, Live Nation. Tom. I'm going to break the rules. Fine. I'll put the first one out there that I think everyone should own shares of, and that is Facebook. Facebook is an incredibly well-managed company. It's going through controversy now. But when you really look at what Facebook is figuring out, they're figuring out how to manage data, privacy issues way beyond what other organizations are facing in terms of social connections around the world, different populations interacting online in ways they haven't before. Uh, it's an incredible company. It's a brilliant company. It, it is also a company that's been mocked for right. 10 years for, oh, does it make money? Is it, I mean, social media is a joke. And uh, now people are beginning to realize, wow, it's possible Facebook is way more powerful than we had any understanding of. And I still think it's an undervalued company. It is a company worth more than $500 billion. So it's not going to be a 10 bagger. I'm going to give you my 10 bagger shot here, which has more risk. And I as get David two? said, yeah, that, that was <laughs> okay. how I was breaking the rules. And that is Stitch Fix, which is a company founded by a woman named Katrina Lake, who went through the process of venture capital, encountering a lot of men on the other side of the table, some who were not well intentioned, some who were well intentioned, very few of whom understood her business model because it was to allow you to order apparel and have it styled for you and delivered to your house in a box and you mail it back if it doesn't work for you. It's a company that came public and the stock dropped afterwards. They didn't get the price they wanted. I love the founders that feel like an underdog, that are doubted and that prove over time through persistence and their ingenuity that they can win very big for everyone associated with that company. I think Stitch Fix, it's a company with a couple hundred million dollars of cash, no debt. They're growing 30%. 25 to 30%, and they've got a founder that I really admire. All right, so thank you both very much for your one investment, and in your case, Tom's two investment I ideas. Cheated. We really appreciate it. Tom Gardner and David Gardner, thanks. Thank you.
At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is know thyself as an investor. David and Tom Gardner were taught about investing in companies by their dad at an early age. They had fun doing it, which is why they started The Motley Fool in the first place, to learn, inform, and entertain. If you love investing like they do, managing your own portfolio is your thing. They also recognize that many people want active management, but also want professionals to do the investing, which is why they launched their mutual funds and investment advisory services. Then there is the third group, where even the thought of investing is anxiety-inducing. The Gardeners strongly recommend that group go with a passive index fund, a no-decision-needed strategy to participate in the market with extremely low expenses and few tax consequences. Knowing yourself as an investor will help you stay the course in whichever approach you take, which, as the Gardner said, is one of the essential elements of investment success. Can't get enough of The Motley Fools? Fear not. Next week, they will be back for part two of their 25th anniversary interview. To see this show again, please go to our website, wealthtruck.com. Let us know what you think by connecting with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences. And the Fairholme Foundation.